Hello, um, so I'm here to talk to you about um, a functional coverage tool we've written um, as part of ViperCore. So I work with Peter Birch. Um, I'm head of verification there. Um, so I'm not going to go over what ViperCore does. If you've forgotten already, then, you know, that's on you. Um, so, and I also apologize to people who may have looked ahead on LinkedIn as to who the speakers were. There's been a flurry of LinkedIn activity. If you're expecting someone with neon orange hair, I do apologize. It disappeared a couple of years ago when my kids started swimming lessons. So um, my LinkedIn profile is a little bit out of date. Um, so um, we've written a new functional coverage tool. I realize there's some out there already. There's like, you know, UVM style coverage, and there's obviously Cocoa TV coverage, um, but it wasn't quite what we wanted. Um, and hopefully this has some unique features that um, might be useful to some. Um, so what I've written it is, it's fully written in Python. Um, so it has very easy integration with Python test benches. Um, it's great for data manipulation, obviously. Um, it's also simulator independent. Um, we don't run it alongside the simulator it attaches to your test bench. Um, so you don't even have to use a simulator. Um, and it's fully open source as well. Um, so it's useful. Um, the reason for writing it mostly was that um, we worked at a previous company. We really liked their approach to coverage, which was different to anything else I'd encountered in my career. And when we left, we couldn't find anything quite like it. So we just remade it, but better. Um, so here's a, some of the features it has. These aren't all unique to this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of common features. Um, but it is f hopefully fairly fully featured now. And there's a few um, quite nice ones we've got. Um, so to start with, I'm going to go sort of from the bottom and work my way upwards. So um, cover points um, are made up of axes. Um, and an axis is very similar to a UVM cover point. It covers one thing, so um, one signal, one bit of data, um, at whatever level of abstraction you like. So it could be you're literally doing all the values of a particular signal. So it might be a mode or something in a bus. Or you can have very, very high level abstraction, um, which is um, instructions or a whole pipeline data. Um, so you pass it uh, an axis a name. You can option provide a description um, and, and a list of values. So if you give it a signal, it won't automatically know what values that signal can take. You'll have to tell it what values you want covered. Um, and you do that by providing a list, set or a um, tuple, um, but preferably a dictionary is quite useful. Um, a dictionary allows you to name your values. So instead of just a list of numbers, you can actually apply meaning to those and that will show up in your coverage. Um, you can specify discrete numbers, or you can specify ranges, and the axis will handle that for you. So you can say between two and 10, and it will. you can then pass it the number seven, and it'll know which one that applies to. Um, we've also um, built some helper ones, so you can say most significant bit axis, or a one hot of four bits, and so forth. Um, so here you can see some examples of adding access. So this is within the cover point setup phase. Um, which I'll come to next. You can specify name, description, and then top example is just a list of names. Um, this could be instruction names if you're doing a CPU. Um, the second one is a list of ranges, and then you can just chunk in the um, integer that you get out of your design, and it will know which one that maps to. And at the bottom is an example of our one hot one. You say four bit one hot, and it will work that out for you. Um, if, I was going to say, the example that is, um, we've got a massive example and loads of documentation on the GitHub page. It's all pet based, so it's, there's a lot of dogs in this. Um, sorry, so you can quite a few terms that I don't understand. Okay, sorry. Um, Explain one heart of pet. Sorry? I don't understand what one heart is. One heart. Um, so if you have, um, so instead of, uh, how do I say? Um, if you've got, um, say, four different modes, you can encode it as a two-bit signal and have zero, one, two, three, or you can have it as a four-bit signal and each bit represents one mode. You can only have one active at a time, so you wouldn't have more than one at once. So um, you wouldn't want all four bits. You just have those four combinations of those four bits. Only, only one spot. Yeah. Um, so um, a cover point is more similar to a cover group in UVM. Um, a cover point consists of one or more axes crossed together to produce your sort of grid of all your possible combinations. Um, this, I find, is much more useful as a default rather than just one thing. Um, so it's the sort of 
what we liked about what we had previously. Um, for this, you can assign goals. So by default, each will have a target of 10 hits to be saturated. Um, you can modify that um, to whatever you like, or you can label them as illegal or ignore. So illegal, you'll throw an error. Ignore just flat out doesn't do anything. Um, and you can have the granularity of you can apply that to one particular combination of axis values, or you can apply it to all or some or whatever you like. Um, we've also got the concept of tiers, which is quite similar to sort of logging verbosity. Um, so you can say tier zero, high priority, it's like critical, you always run this cover point. Um, quite useful if you're wanting a CI. Um, and then you can have a higher level, say number seven, uh, it's up to you, um, which might be one that you might only start hitting on a weekend regression, very, very large, and it's probably going to take up a lot of time and wasted effort if you just want a quick CI run, so you can specify what kind of, how many importance of cover points you want to include. And tags is just so you can tag it with information to group it, and it allows um, later on for easy filtering and sorting through your cover points. Um, so this is an example of um, creating a cover point. So I'm not going through it too much, but you can see there at the top, there's a default name, description, and motivation. Um, descriptions are what you are covering. Uh, motivation is what you're trying to cover, the aim of the cover point. And you can check the two marry up when you're doing a coverage review um, in case things have shifted along the way. Um, you have a setup function, you add your axes. Um, I've shortened it there, but obviously as the previous slide showed. Um, another goal where you can basically say, this is an illegal one or increase your target hit count. You then apply the goal, so you say which bucket combinations it applies to. And then a sample function, which basically gets a trace object, which is from your test bench, full of all the data that you want. Um, and then you can pick out the bits that are uh, uh, relevant and assign it to the um, bucket. Um, come back to that. Um, sample function can also filter out any data it doesn't need. So if it, the cover point wakes up and gives a load of data, and it's like, none of this data applies to me. Like, if I'm a doggy cover point, then this is all about cats. Just shut down, don't do anything. Um, and then finally, we have cover groups, which you help make a hierarchy of other cover groups and cover points. Um, so you can make a nice big coverage tree. Um, and we also have sort of a smart sampling. So you can say, for example, in the cover group A, um, it's aware of what cover points it has. So if that was all the dog coverage down here and you had cat data coming through, you can say, well, don't pass the data on because all the cover points have to wake up and decide it's not relevant and shut down. So instead the cover group can just go, this isn't relevant for you and just skip ahead. So it's a bit more optimal than um, them all deciding to wake up and shut down. Uh, and this is a cover group. So um, quite simple default name and description, which can be overridden when you instance it. Um, again, set up function just to declare which ones. And then a should sample function, which is just whatever criteria you like to decide whether or not it should be um, passing on to its children um, the trace data. Sampling data. So the trace objects um, coming out of your test bench or for where else, um, we're using a data class um, and loads of nested classes. Um, it can be literally whatever you like, but as long as you've got a way to collect all your data um, and pass it on. So we, um, for CPU verification, we have multiple trace objects in flights, um, tracing instructions through the pipeline. So as it goes through each pipeline stage, we append additional information. And when it goes to the commit stage, we fire it off the coverage as just this complete from fetch to commit um, instruction information, which we can then sort of have all the cover points run against. Um, we can sample from anywhere. As long as you make your trace object, um, it can be straight from the test bench um, or from your simulation. Um, you can run it straight against your model, um, or you can even, if you've saved your test output or logged in sufficient detail to recreate your test object, then that allows you to um, run against that instead. So as I said, some examples there. Um, the nice bit about the bottom one is um, if you save your test output um, in whatever format, um, then if you've run a weekend regression and you come in on Monday morning and you've discovered that you've actually written your cover point wrong and it's collected the data incorrectly or there's some other issue, if you've got your trace data, you can just rerun it against your fixed coverage. You can then collect all your coverage and then that'll still merge with future simulations um, or regressions. It, it's not separate, it's still mergeable. Um, you just instance that coverage again um, outside of your test bench. Um, 
So it allows for a lot of flexibility. And it also allows you to run against directly against the model. You can check if your model runs faster, which tests are going to hit the coverage you haven't yet hit, and then run those tests against your um, RTL. Um, it's all the same coverage. You can just instance it wherever. Um, cool. Uh, filtering. Filtering allows you to run subsets of your coverage that still are mergeable with a full coverage run. So um, this is useful for several things. If you're writing new tests to say target load store instructions, you don't want to run everything. You just want to target the load store coverage. So you can just specify that um, and run that subset. But then if you want to merge that with the main regression set, you still can. Um, it also allows you to say on a very large regression, you might run say on a Friday evening until midnight, a few thousand tests, and they might hit 60% of your cover points and saturate them you can then exclude them from the next batch of your regression, so you're not running all the cover points you've already saturated. You can then speed up and run more tests um, on just the coverage you've yet to hit. Um, and filtering allows you to filter by anything within the cover point. So the tiers and the tags I mentioned earlier, the name, um, any information you pass in as extra parameters, you can um, use as a filter. So we provide the include, exclude, and restrict filters. Um, they should be quite easy to use. Um, we've also got a web-based viewer, so you can dump stuff out in the console, but um, uh, my colleague Ed has written a very nice um, web viewer, so it opens up in your browser, um, allows for easy navigation, filtering of values, so you can just see the buckets you want to see, you can sort columns, um, so I'm sure. a couple of screenshots, um, so this is what you see when you open it up, you've got your cover tree on the left there, um, you can click all these links to open up particular cover groups and cover points. Um, to explain the things up on the right here, um, goal on the left um, is the total of your target values. So your, if you've got 10 hits per cover point to saturate, that's the total of your targets plus the hits and a percentage of that. Very useful if your cover point is quite uniform. But say if you had a really weird cover point that had a goal of one for most things and then a goal of 1,000 for one particular bucket, that coverage could be very misleading. Um, as to how far your cover point has been hit. So it's very useful in combination with this bucket one over here. Um, the hit percentage there for buckets is, has it had at least one hit? So it may be partial, it may be saturated, but has it had at least one? So you can see a uniform distribution across all your buckets. If that's 100%, you know that you've got at least one hit in every single option. Um, and the last one is, what percentage of each bucket is full? Like, has it been saturated? So um, you can see in your cover point which ones are starting to saturate and where the holes might be. Okay, cool, thank you. Almost there. Um, this is what happens when you click on a cover point. Um, there's a little button at the top so you can sort or you can click on the filter option and just see, I don't see, you know, Graham and Peter on this list and it will just hide all the other ones. You can concentrate on where the holes might be. Um, you can do the same over here with a number of hits and goals and stuff. So see which ones are partial hits. Um, we're using this internally. This is our main functional coverage tool. Um, so it's under active development. Um, we've got a feature roadmap. There's more on the GitHub page, but we are working towards better merging, um, providing a minimal test set um, that hits the same coverage um, from regression, tracking which test cases contributed to which bits of coverage. So you can say this bucket was hit by this test, so you know where to focus your energy if you've got holes. Um, we haven't optimized any of this for speed yet. It's all written in Python. It's not particularly fast, but until it matures, and then we'll work out where the bottlenecks are. But it's, it's fairly good for now. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's, that was what my hair used to be. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. All right, questions. Rob. Yeah. Um, so I know some web pages like you, you, you suggest uh, using cover speed or you could just choose another backend. Would you be interested in Amaranth Sim and the Sim backend in general? Stuart, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, sorry, is that just so you can use it with, um, can you use it with other? Things? Yeah, we'd be Um, yeah, um, the Amman similar back end, oh, sorry, similar back end would be fine. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, you instance it um, and then you, 
There's better documentation on the GitHub page. I've skipped over a lot, but it's basically you instance your coverage and your test bench. It doesn't really matter if that's talking to a model, a simulator, anything. It just goes into a test bench and you pass it the trace object. So it doesn't really require um, any amendments to bucket to make it work. It's just a Python instance that you pass your trace data into. Um, so it should be very easy to just hook it up to whatever you like, be that a log parser, a simulator, a test bench model should just work. Stuart, I have a question. You uh, alluded to the fact that, or you didn't allude, you explained that you can rerun, you know, coverage collection against an existing trace. You don't have to like regenerate the stimulus. Uh, what sort of trace? Like GTK wave, VCD? Uh, not that kind of trace. Um, Your trace. My, my trace object. So uh, it's probably the bad okay. name, but um, yeah, it's basically a data class. We use a data class full of all our objects, um, data that we want to. We've pulled up the pipeline, we've populated it. It's yeah. just a Python object full of all the data that's interesting. Yeah. Um, if you export that into SQL or YAML or XML or even just a human readable log that you can read past with the right amount of data, yeah. you can reform that Python object rather than it coming straight from the test bench um, live at the simulator. Yeah. You can just save it and then just replay it back into the coverage if you want to change your coverage without having to rerun all your regression. Yeah. Um, so obviously it's a lot of data to store. Yeah. But it's a lot quicker to then modify your coverage and play with it with a big regression set of data. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. That's cool. I apologize up front. This is a bit of a bike shedding thing. But <laughs> could, you, could you use something else than the word axis and then axes? Because it's kind of annoying if I have to think about the plural. Oh, I replaced the I by the E. Could you use <laughs> label and then labels as the plural? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, for non-natives, it might be. <laughs> and for hardware designers who use AXI bus, it's like, oh, this is not uh, multiple AXI buses. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, we're not particularly tied to it. Um, it's called Axis because you sort of plot out all your, um, on a like, Cartesian grid of all your possible combinations. So it's kind of axes of a grid. Um, it is also the word that our previous company used. I'm pretty sure the people from that company may recognize a lot of the syntax that's up here. Um, I'm pretty sure that you could take this and replace the in-house tool that you're using, um, and it would just work. Um, but the back end is completely rewritten and hopefully better. So, um, but yeah, um, if the name's a problem, we're not tied to it, but um, that's why it's called Access. Maybe. Alrighty, let's, uh, oh, sorry, go on, you go. Sorry, the, the, repeat the question. So if I get you right, uh, an issue with collecting coverage not but when you don't have the VPI interface available. No, no, just oh. um, when you're not in system barrel or plan yeah. and you're having to interface over something like VPI, yeah. does that start being a problem when you're trying to uh, sample many signals across the design of the coverage? Because he's not, he's not doing... I think the question is if you're doing like code coverage through a VPI, it's going to be really, really difficult. But he's doing functional coverage, right? But if you're taking lots of data out of the design, I mean, it's kind of your test bench is going to have to pull all this data out for the monitors and the scoreboarding anyway. This is just then taking that data and shoving it over to coverage. So it's if you want to cover more than your monitors are pulling out, then yeah, the more signals you add to that, then obviously the slower it's going to get. But um, we haven't really noticed much of a problem. We have all that data there anyway in the test bench. Um, so it's just kind of there already. It's not anything you're doing additional. Okay. That's thanks, Stuart. Cheers, cool. mate. Thank you.